Hi, I'm Martin, and welcome to Upgrade Your Day, the podcast. Today, I talk to a lovely friend of mine who I've had the pleasure in doing a couple of pantomime seasons with. She's a musical director turned published photographer and writer. I opened my email and I had an email from Michael Palin <laughs> in my email inbox. And I was freaking out, Martin, and I didn't know one, and there was no one around. Every, it was, I was just standing in the middle of London just going, ah! Lindsay had the opportunity to move to North Korea for a couple of years. And in that time, she took a lot of photographs. She learned a lot about North Korean people. And this is a chat about all of that, everything that happened with her leading up to publishing a book, which is truly inspirational. And we talk so much about her photography and what it means to her, especially being in North Korea. So I really hope you enjoy this. Here is the gorgeous Lindsay Miller. Good morning. Good morning. I I have to say, first of all, I'm trying to work out. So we did pantomime what year? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Um, now that is really a question. I mean, it, maybe 2016, 2015. It was, was two it, years. Was it? Do you remember the it opening was, number? Um, I, well, I remember we did Aladdin. I remember doing Aladdin. Ah. And I remember doing, uh, which had You Can't Stop the Beat at the end. And yes. I remember yeah. doing Beauty and the Beast. Oh, so Aladdin well. had Giovanni, who was on The X Factor, who's now in Cinderella. That was right, wasn't it? Yeah. And yep. then Beauty and the Beast. Yes, now I remember. With Ridian. With Ridian, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a long time ago. I forgot all about that. Um, yeah, we haven't aged a day, Martin. <laughs> you are looking <laughs> radiant. Your Botox is shining through. So. <laughs> oh, thank you. It was well so- worth the money. <laughs> We should say, obviously, being the super duper musical director that you are, what are you doing at the moment? What are you working on? Um, I'm actually in Stratford on Avon, sunny Stratford. And I've been here since March and we're doing Henry VI Rebellion and Henry VI Wars of the Roses, which actually closes tomorrow. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, show tonight, two tomorrow, and then that's me. And then I'm off to Scotland to spend some time with family on the beach with the dogs, oh. just out walking, resting, and then on to another show after that. What part of Scotland are you from? Kind of a bit of a mongrel, really, from, <laughs> from all over. From all over. Um, originally Glasgow, but uh, and all my family pretty much stay there. But my mum and dad now live on the coast near St Andrews, which oh, is very lovely. pretty. Lots of lovely coastal routes and um, lovely walks. It's just a gorgeous part of the country. Yeah, how nice. Are you um, coming up to the Edinburgh Fringe in August? Oh, I'm not going to be here. I'm actually, uh, uh, in July, I'm flying out to Thailand oh. to join my husband who's out there. And he's he's going to be based there for three years. So I'm heading over there, <laughs> heading oh. over there for, <laughs> for a period of time. Who knows how long before the next job and I come back. Well, I tell you what, that, that leads me perfectly on to my very last question, Basali, even though we've just started this. I mean, right, what, firstly, let me make a note of that one, because my last question was, are you going to make any more books? And what you've just said now means that I think there might be a book number two coming along. Well, I can neither confirm nor deny that okay, I'm going to come back to this at the end. I'm going to come back to this. So <laughs> what I should say is you have written this book and I'm so proud of you because even though we're friends and we see one another on Facebook and online and everything, during Panto, we got chance to sort of have dinner and drinks and socialise, but then life takes over and you're here, I'm there and so on and so on. But when I saw on your social media that you'd got a book deal, um, it's called Two Years of Living in the World's Most Secretive State, North Korea, Like Nowhere Else by Lindsay Miller. I was so, so flipping proud of you. How cool to have a book, like a whole book of all your photos, words, everything. It's it's amazing. So firstly, I just want to say well done, because to get books published nowadays, I mean, you know, it's 
I hope you did lots of celebrating when this came out. I did. It was really weird. And thank you so much. I, I'm proud of me too. And uh, <laughs> it's been a long old journey. Um, I did. It was very odd because it, it was published during <clears throat> the sort of height of the pandemic with restrictions and things. So I didn't have a book launch or anything. I, I, I was sent a box by my publisher and I opened them in my house with just me and my husband and the dog. And um, and then I was kind of like, oh, what do I do now? I've got this box of 20 books and I don't, I don't know what to do because I can't go anywhere and I can't do anything with anyone. Um, so I had a little kind of a little swally with my mum and dad and, and some close family on Zoom, as you do. Um, and that was it, really. So it's it, it's kind of, I know it's out there and I know people are reading it, but because, because that sort of element of, you know, birthing it into the world, it, it didn't really happen. It's been really bizarre. Um, how, how was it when you opened that box and saw your book with your name on it? How did that feel to you? Oh, you know, I thought about that moment when I went to bed for for the year and a half that I knew it was happening. I thought about what that would feel like. It used to, and that's what I, th- I always thought when I went before I went to sleep. And when I opened it, I was I was physically shaking. Like I, I, I and I I was just thinking of like what a huge moment. You know, you think of all those big big moments in your life when you get married or you, you know, you make a commitment of some kind. And it, it was kind of like that, the significance, of, because it's the most personal thing yeah, yeah. I've ever done. And to share it in that way, I, I've, it's completely new for me. And, um, you know, and you're putting yourself out there for criticism and and or, or, or and any kind of engagement with people of something that's really personal to you. And uh, I just cried, and I and I sort of held the book, and I was like, I don't. I thought about it so much to actually have it in my hands felt surreal, and um and I'm really proud of it, and I'm I'm proud of what it it represents. Um, what it stands for and what it, it fight, what the words that it, that it's fighting for and the people it's fighting to to highlight. Um, so I'm really, I'm just really grateful for the experience and the opportunity. And I'd recommend anybody go for it. You know, I don't consider myself a writer and yet I've written a book. You know, I, I would say to anybody who wants to do it, just do it. You know, yeah. just go for it because the, what's the worst that's going to happen? Someone turns around and goes, it's not for us. You know, I I literally just Googled, how do I pitch to write a book? You know, and and I didn't know what I was doing. And anybody can, you know. So you pitched the idea and then they came back to you. Was it one of those scenarios where you had sort of 17 rejection letters or or did it happen quite quickly? Um, It was a bit of an odd one because I didn't have a writing agent. I, I, I was applying to publishers and agents at the same time. And I'd, I'd Googled how to write a pitch. And um, I found this kind of skeleton online of, of a book pitch. I'd never seen one. I don't know what they what publishers want, but I just did my research. And then I, I started putting this pitch together. And um, and then I, I, bought, I, I bought this book that's kind of the, ind- the publishing industry, who's who. And the theatre has one as well. All the agents, all the publishers, all the people you need to know. And I just went through A to Z, all the publishers, Googled them, looked at what books they had on their list, who's got gaps, you know, who doesn't have a book on this or who does publish books that are along those lines or who represents people with that kind of interest in writing. And um, and I applied to them and I did. I got a lot of rejections, um, but I got two... Uh, notes of interest from two publishers as an unrepresented writer and then at the same time I also got two notes of interest from two agents so I'd had interest from publishers before I had an agent and then I kind of said had to say to the publishers look I think I should get an agent because I don't know what I'm doing I, I theatre is fine you know <laughs> but the writing and publishing absolutely not a scooby so I, I went back to the agents managed, and then got an, ag- an offer from an agent and then we kind of then went back to those publishers um 
And uh, and I I, th- I really believe that was the right thing to do, um, and it was great to have the support because as I say, I know not, I, you know I'm still learning. I'm very new. There's all this jargon flying around about publishing, and I'm kind of like I don't understand. Well, you're um, used to you're uh, used to playing instruments. You're used to conducting, managing. Uh, you're a musical director, so that's your what you do, isn't it? You know, so it's a whole new yeah. it's a whole new world really for you coming back to Aladdin. <laughs> but it is yeah. a whole new world, though, isn't it? It's completely completely you're, you're starting from scratch really it is it's, it's it's been a total learning experience but in the best way and and what i've found as well is that you know you can think of a million reasons why not to do something but um when you get that little buzz of energy that goes actually i'm just gonna i'm just gonna do it i'm just gonna start start just tiny pieces of things and go i'm just gonna investigate I'm not going to think about applying to publishers. I'm just going to look into who else has done it for today. That's going to be my task. And over time, those all grow. And actually, then you're equipped with a huge amount of information that then can motivate you to do something about it. Um, but I think the working in theatre, you know, we're storytellers. We we focus on people and their stories. We're empathetic. We we. Um, really think deeply about connections and and story arcs and um, and what audiences respond to and how to package that in a way that communicates clearly and that's those are all the same things as writing yeah you know so it, when I was writing it that's all I was thinking about was you know if this was a show this is what I, these are the kind of things I'd be looking for yeah so um, it's all linked my motto of a great your day is little by little day by day. And I think that's the best way you can go about it, which is why when I did all my mindfulness training and I started sort of seeing what it was and why it was helping me so much, it was a case of you can't throw yourself into something. You can't sit and meditate for an hour a day when you've never meditated in your life. It's, it's too much. And you end up going, Oh, I, I can't do this. You know, it doesn't work. You have to go in very small steps. Hence my three minute upgrade, where I just ask people to do three minutes a day. And if you can do three minutes a day, which is boiling a kettle an ad break on the telly, if you still watch ordinary telly, it's all it takes. Anybody can do three minutes a day. And if you start with that, it's amazing what it can lead up to. And I guess it's the same with publishing a book. I mean, crikey, you did it by going little by little, day by day, step by step. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. It is just those little things. It's much more digestible and it doesn't feel as overwhelming. So, I mean, even when writing, you know, I remember in school writing essays and, and trying to write an opening line and just going, I just feeling overwhelmed and going, I have to write a thousand words or however many and, and how do I start this? And actually, the way I've written this book has, has been to not think that way and just go, I'm going to start at the start and finish it at the end. It's actually what's in my head. Right. I've thought of this person. So I write their name and then something that happened. And it doesn't matter if the thoughts are scattered all over the place and it doesn't really make sense. And I finish the sentence in the middle and then I take a new line and I'm in the middle of a next thought. It doesn't matter. It's just getting it down. And then once you have all that information, then you can sort of start to craft it and edit it and yeah. rejig it and make it more coherent. It's it's that step. You know, I think it's very easy to kind of, as you say, go, I need to sit and do Yes. An hour's worth of cross-legged med- meditation under a tree. And it's like actually, you know, eating a piece of toast and actually being really mindful of what you're eating and where you are and what it tastes like, what it smells like and connecting to that moment. Mm. That's far more effective mm. and nurturing. Um, and so likewise, the same with writing. How did you in your head deal with the fact that your personal photos and words and work and an effort is going out there to everybody. It's out on, I mean, I pre-ordered mine on Amazon. It was out. How do you deal with that within your own mind? Um, I, it's an ongoing thing. Um, Cause I still, I, I'm still in a bit of disbelief that it's out there and, um, and, and, you know, and it's around the world as well. You know, I get pictures from people of it in bookshops around the world, which is bizarre. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess in terms of responses to it, 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 it and just kind of dealing with those, I've not had any negative responses. Everything has been so loving and 
just the most humbling, lovely messages from people from, from, as I say, from all over the world, you know, from the UK, from South Korea, North Koreans, you know, um, writing to me to tell me how this book's really affected them and, and they appreciate it. So that, that is a, as a help, that's a, that's a driving force to kind of go, I was, I was right to, to go forward with this and to, to use my voice and to, create something because it is connecting with people in terms of negatives the only negative stuff really is is kind of comments on youtube mm. interviews i've done but even then they're in languages that i don't read which is actually <laughs> quite nice because yeah. i i can't understand and i don't i don't I, I translated one once and i went why am i doing this i i don't i'm not you know the people who actually get in touch with me to talk, to engage with me is one thing but i never read comments or anything like that no, it's one of those things, isn't it? You should never read comments. I know when we did our, our Basil Brush show in Edinburgh, there were so many lovely tweets about how much they enjoyed it. The Grown Up Show, which is a whole new thing. Lots of positivity. And then, as always, I mean, it's so old school to say this, but out of 90, well, out of 100 good comments, there's like that one comment. And you end, I, and I did at the time, I remember thinking, Who's, who said this? What, what reviewer said this? And looked at the reviewer and looked where he was based and, who, and, and making this whole story of why he might have been so horrible. It's so strange, isn't it? Because you can, you can be in a room full of people who are applying applauding and having a great time and you're focused on that one person with their arms crossed yeah. you know and and it, I, I don't know what it is you know yeah. but it's 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 as you say it's it is that's a mindful choice to to take control of that moment and go actually rather than being controlled by someone else and and what they might be going through that day or the reason why they might have written that i'm gonna be mindful of myself and the control i want to take over that moment and what i and i i think in terms of what we digest, whether that's digitally or um, through, through, you know, through what we watch or listen to, um, what we read or what we eat, um, what, how we exercise, it's all, it's all be, it's all to nourish your body and your mind, you know, and I think it's very easy to go, well, we must eat healthily, you know, because that fuels our body. But then you've also got your mind as well. And you, you, that doesn't, you know, food helps good food helps that but the way you think and the way you engage is actually what's going to nourish that part of you um and that's more difficult but it translates into moments like that where you go actually i'm not going to focus on that one person yeah. i'm going to focus on this good stuff and what works for you as well you know there is there's no rule in anything even with mindfulness whatever you kind of sign up for there is no rules and for me it was walking which is where everything came from with upgrade your day because i used to walk so much in edinburgh and just put myself in a good place about it i remember thinking you know it's like comedies like mrs brown's boys some people are really vocal about how much they detest it and then there's other people saying well hang on a minute it sells out arenas of the live show it's series after series it's top rated at christmas i've seen my parents rolling around in laughter but whatever you think it is whether it's dated or whatever that's fine something for everyone and i think you have to remember that don't you and you have to remember that sometimes when i comment now on things um, i always say in my opinion <laughs> rather than just throwing something out there because that's what it is it's just my opinion but but also with the book review wise did you get reviews by a lot of people because obviously in theatre you know we have all these reviews and you just think it's one person for the Telegraph or the the Guardian it's one person's opinion which I always find strange with reviews how about book reviews what happens with that um so they are the books are submitted to various um outlets whether that's newspapers magazines bloggers as well um a lot of people on social media run big instagram accounts all kinds of things um so they're sent out and um and you kind of have to wait and see what comes back it's re it is really hard in the same way you know if you're starting out at the fringe or something you know, of getting people to come and see your show. Yes. You know, we've all, I mean, I've been there as well, flyering on the mile <laughs> among thousands of people um, and trying to find the reason why people should come see your show when there are countless others. Um, it's kind of like that with books as well, where, and particularly during the pandemic, there's so much out there. And also written by you know very well known writers who are very successful and people love their books, 
Um, so coverage is, is going to be weighted more towards that, understandably. Um, so as a first time writer with zero profile <laughs> and um, but with this book, um, it's the same as flying on the mile. And you have to just kind of hope that someone picks up on it. And, and it has it has brought back some really great opportunities. The most the most amazing one was was Michael Palin. And um, because I, my publisher said, we can send some books to some people, whoever you want, you know, just make a list of people you think might be interested. So I did. And I put Michael Palin down because he'd been to North Korea and then had written a book about it at the same time as I was there. And I'd spoken to some North Koreans who had knew other, knew his guides who were with him in his documentary and, and I was talking so I was talking to them about him and his guides and and that process from a different perspective and they were telling me about how um I don't know if you've seen his his North Korea uh, BBC yes. piece oh, yeah. and and, uh, and and so the guides I was with was te- were telling me that his guides uh were selected from this big group of of uh female tour guides and they had to audition to to be his tour guides and they had to put they had to do like these improvisation games where they'd in a big group um and fire questions at each other and they'd be marked on how well they answered these questions or how personable they were and you know like drama games almost you know as well as the actual content of what they were saying i thought i really want to tell them that so i thought there's a great opportunity to tell them this um, and my publisher said, write a letter and uh, we'll put it in. And I put my email address and everything in it, said that, you know, little story. And he wrote, and I had an email from him. Oh my gosh. And I just opened my, and I actually, it was on the day we were allowed to meet in groups of six, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and in restaurants. And so I was in London with my publisher, my agent, and a couple of other people from the publishing company. And that was my celebratory lunch. It was a we went to a Korean restaurant, and um, and when I left, I opened my email and I had an email from Michael Palin <laughs> in my email inbox, and I was freaking out, Martin, and I had no one, and there was no one around. Every I was, was just standing in the middle of London, just going, ah! and uh, and yeah, we had a really nice email exchange, and he was so lovely to not only take the time, but for the words he said about the book. So, um, and then that was used as a, in a review, as a yeah. review on the website as well. Yeah. And I'm sure that'll go on your next book. That'll be the top one. There'll be a nice little oh, yeah. quote on there. <laughs> but now, now listen, <laughs> now, if I was you, if I was you, I would go into bookshops and I'd find my book and I would take them out and I'd put them all around the shelves. Have you done that? Absolutely. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> right in the middle. As soon as I, I've done a lot of feng shui um, <laughs> in various Waterstones. Tell me how this all began. How did this work? Because I remember on social media, you saying um, that you were moving over for a few years. And I remember thinking, crikey, that's a big move. That's a very brave thing to do. And I was very excited. I was excited for you, but I was also quite anxious. I was thinking, crikey, how would I feel doing a move like that for a few years? So just explain a bit about that. Mm. Well, I felt the same. Um, so my husband, he's a diplomat and there's a British embassy out there. It's a very small embassy. There's five uh, members of staff there. And um, he got a job working in that embassy. And when he told me about it, I actually said, I'm not going. I'm not doing it. Because all I'd seen in the news was at that time, particularly, and uh, it was really bad. There'd been a number of missile tests and I thought, I can't, I can't live in that country. I'm, I'm going to be killed. No. And I, and I was quite prepared to live in the UK for two years while he was elsewhere. And I mean, that would have just been silly, but I was just was so adamant that I didn't want to go. And then I just had a change. It, literally, I was just doing the ironing and just thought, What an amazing opportunity to go somewhere where hardly anyone gets to go in a capacity that very few people get to go. I mean, 
to be there as a diplomat, I was there as, I wasn't a diplomat, but diplomatic spouse with diplomatic community and, and protections, a system around you to protect you from the things I'm, I, was, I would be worried about if I was there as a tourist. I thought that's an incredible opportunity. So let's do it. And uh, I quit my job and flew out there. Um, and, and I was really anxious. I was really nervous. I had no idea what to expect because, like, I, I think I, I'd read a lot about North Korea. I'd gone through a little period in uni of being really fascinated and watching documentaries and reading books and defectors' testimonies and just devouring information about this place of which there wasn't very much information. So to go there it felt really strange. Um of going, wow, it's real. And these people are real. And I sat next to a North Korean guy in Beijing airport and he had his pen on, his, his, with the Kims on it. And I was so scared sitting next to him because I was like, I, I also didn't speak Korean at the time, but I, I was just like, I don't know what to do. And he dropped a receipt out of his pocket and uh, and I automatically went to pick it up because that's what you do to be nice to help. And then I handed it to him and he sort of gave me a thumbs up and a wink, you know, and took, and I thought, oh, wow, he seems really friendly because I'd only, I'd only seen North Korean people as being like robots, you know, as marching in lines, all looking identical in these parades and, or jumping and clapping at the leaders and things. I hadn't ever seen anyone give me a thumbs up and a wink, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and smile at, at sitting next to me. When you first moved and, and you obviously sort of got yourself settled and so on and so on, when it came to day to day, I mean, how did that feel for you? Those first sort of few days, those first few weeks of just living there, because I, I know a friend of mine moved to Australia and um, I think she thought, you know, as soon as they got there, it'd be walking the kids to school over Summer Bay and all that kind of thing. And all the sunshine and all lovely and little coffee shops. And she arrived in the middle of Sydney. It was pouring with rain. It was, you know, more built up than London. And she was like, oh my gosh, it was, it was quite a shock, really. How did you mm. deal with just that normality? Because like they say, you could be anywhere washing up in your kitchen, looking out the window, and you really could be anywhere. Even though we have this romantic vision of places, how was that for you? It was. I mean, the first couple of weeks, I I struggled to leave the house because I was so scared. I, I, the, you know, there's soldiers everywhere. But then there are, because North Korea's got an enormous army, a huge amount of people, percentage of the population go into the military. And it's a, you know, military, big part of the state. So there are, of course, you're going to see soldiers. But I was just so scared. I was scared of doing the wrong thing. I was scared of saying the wrong, you know, getting someone into trouble. I, I was scared of of going some, walking down a street I shouldn't or, you know, and I can't speak Korean. I just, uh, so I, it took a while to kind of get the courage to just go out. How did you start getting into, was the photography side of it just something that you just took lots of photographs, you decided to do something with it? Or when you were snapping away, did you think, there's something in this. I'm really going to document this journey. I think, I mean, I like anyone else. I like taking, I, I like taking photographs as just something as a hobby. Um, I never considered myself artistically a photographer, um, but I, I had been taking photos since I arrived. So actually, if you look at my photos, they're quite interesting because when I first arrived, I took them of buildings. It was all of buildings, cars, streets, it just the 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 kind of first impression, and then as you look through my photos, and there I've got eleven thousand photos in my in my DPRK album on my computer. If you look through them and you see the progression, you know it goes from buildings, food, buildings, food, buildings, food, buildings, food, into people, and and it, and then it's just really people. It's focused on portraits and um, daily activities and just everyday life because that's where my fascination was of like what is life like for these people and trying to understand it, trying to understand what was real, like what what being or in that environment, what was I seeing that was representative of the real experience of North Korean people? And what was I seeing that was trying to cover it up or was the, the facade of the regime of pretending everything's hunky-dory when it isn't? And um, and that did things in my head. And then the photography 
it, it very quickly became a way for me to express myself freely in an environment where I didn't feel free. You know, I had a lot more freedom than North Korean people, um, you know, and I could go out and walk around and drive and things, but um, it wasn't a free for all. You know, I would go to places and be turned away and told I can't come in, even though it's busy because I'm a foreigner and they don't, you know, they don't want me in there. Um, and, and, you know, there's things I could and couldn't do. Um, there's a language barrier as well, which was really frustrating. And and just pe- the fear I had of speaking to a North Korean person and putting them at risk and also perceiving any kind of fear in them of me going near. I felt like kryptonite. I just was like, I don't want to, I don't want to cause anybody any problems. And so I used to, you know, I've talked about in the book of being followed, um, of having people recording conversations, you know, all kinds of things. And, uh, and photography really, it was a way for me to be, to find freedom in that environment and I, I took a DSLR camera. It wasn't with my phone, really. It was it was with a proper camera. And um, I'd just walk around snapping pictures and just go, it was a way of me being able to say, this is how I see daily life here. You know, that's not through the lens of propaganda, Western as well as North Korean. It's not through the news or the media. It's my eyes seeing this. And this is how I see the people. This is how I see what's around me. And then it allowed me afterwards to then jump back into a moment, a very split second, and spend a lot more time with that person in the shop. You know, someone I'd walk past and, th- and really think a lot of deep thoughts about what life was like for them, trying to understand what they go through. You also start this, I think the first and last pictures in the book are people, which is is how it should be. But then you have some beautiful pictures of nature, especially the very back as well. I love the one at the very back. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely stunning. Um, how was nature for you? Did you go out walking in nature? Did you, did you, as, as you know, with me, I take photos of, of going on my walks because I find it quite a mindful thing to do. Just sit and watch. And that's how you kind of, connect to the present moment and and if you see something if you see anything at all that wasn't there when you're walking but just by sitting you see so much did you do that did you do a lot of things like that did you just sit and watch I did I did I did a lot of that I loved walking um I used to just uh, that I used to take my camera and just go out you know with no plans for the day just go out and see what happens if I walk past somewhere I want to drop in for a cup of tea or something I can go do that um and that photo at the end of the book um, is a spectacular view. And that's a walk I did quite a number of times. And there was a couple, there was a mountain in very close to Pyongyang called Dragon Mountain. And there's another one called Mount Myohyang, which was about an hour, just over an hour drive from Pyongyang called Mount Myohyang, which means fragrant mountain. And um, so those were quite, you know, within easy reach for a day trip. Um, to go hiking and there's when you arrive there's big kind of mosaic murals of showing you the different routes you can do and there's waterfalls you can go see there's pavilions there's all kinds of things and I just I loved the calmness because it also reminded me a lot of Scotland I, I mean I have a lot of my really fond memories of my me and my dad walking my dad is a Munro bagger he's claimed every Munro in Scotland a Munro, um, a, a Munro bagger what does that a mean? Munro bagger so the Munro I think I can't he's gonna if he watches this I'm sorry dad you don't I don't know what the height of these mountains are I know you've told me a million times but it's a certain number of meters over sea level is ah. classified as a Munro and there's a I think there's nearly 300 of them in Scotland and um, you can, it, it, people who claim them to try and do them all are called Munro baggers. Right, got you. And so he he has claimed, he's claimed them all. Um, and he, he finished it just before lockdown, actually. Um, so he's done wow. all of them. So I, so I remember doing a lot of hikes with him. So it just reminded me of a really calm, happy place of just fresh air. As you say, no phone. I wouldn't take my phone with me. Um, I would just take a picnic and just go. And it was just really lovely. It, it offered peace, quiet, um, 
There were lots of lovely little waterfalls and pools, like bright blue coloured water. You could swim in with little fish kind of swimming around. Um, sometimes you take a little barbecue. I remember it was raining once and we had to, there's a brilliant picture of me, it's not in the book, but of under this enormous rock with a little barbecue, little fire going, <laughs> making these horrible hot dogs, you know, in the rain, um, persevering to the end. But it just it just offered a lovely sense of peace and otherworldliness, and um, but at the same time also kind of going, I could be anywhere, mm. you know. I, I there's nothing apart from the they'd carve propaganda into the cliffs and things, so you were never completely away from the fact it was North Korea. But mm. just being among the trees, hearing the birds, looking out at views like that, it really took took you to a different place. Um, and so we try and do that as much as we could because we just needed it to feel connected. It's know? funny because I always say to people, if you can get out and walk, um, you know, a few hours a day, if you can, not everyone can, because we all have busy lives, but it's such a mindful thing to do. And it's a great way of just not necessarily switching off, but just connecting to what's going on with you and addressing it and thinking through things. Like I said about the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, but I also say, if you're the kind of person that gets bored, I always say photography is so good because if you can just look for something, just look um, below you, above you, look through things, just try and find things that might make a lovely photo. And actually you start seeing more, you start opening your eyes to so much more. And as you say, why not snap away and create your own little book at the end of the summer or a week or a year, whatever. But these little books online are quite cheap to to print now so why not create your own little book of, of memories of you know a year of walking or something i think that's a cool thing to do did you did you purposely find it mindful to head off with your camera yeah i did it's it started out as being just something i i do for the day and then it actually became i i i feel like i need to do this to keep me sane you know and um and in terms of taking photos of things, some things are very spontaneous. Um, and then other, and there, it's interesting with that book as well. I did, I did mindfully see things, spend time with them and then take a photo. But there were also, and the moments I write about in the book where they're short stories, those are moments where I was really mindfully engaged with what was around me, but it didn't feel appropriate to take a photo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but that moment still stayed with me, and so I decided to write about it. And actually, even the writing process and going back through the photos was a mindful exercise, because particularly with writing, I'd heard people uh, have always kind of said, "Oh, you know, writing is really good for processing experiences." You know, I've never been able to keep journals. I'm so rubbish at blogs and I, you know I just don't have the sticking power I've, I never have and um, it's never worked for me but actually having a goal of, of writing that book really helped it forced me to do it but these short stories forced me to go back into those moments and really find the right words to completely capture a feeling rather than just what I was seeing but a feeling Mm -hmm. And that was a really powerful experience to do that. Really healing, very cathartic, and um, just hugely helpful in yeah. processing that experience. And um, so the, in terms of mindfulness, that process for me was really, really powerful, as well as the photos and going through them again. Yeah, I mean, if I go on a long ramble, I'll put my phone on airplane mode so it just becomes a camera and I'll snap away here and there. I try and take some mindful moments just to sit, to watch, take a few pictures and then I put my phone away. And I think that's really important as well. And when I get home, there's something really enjoyable and again, very mindful of going through the photos, picking some favourites. I love editing them. Um, you know, I love sort of, playing around with them to a certain extent and cropping and so on and so on not photoshopping in <laughs> massive elephants swimming down the river thames or anything like that but just keeping it quite simple and that's very therapeutic and it's very relaxing however i just see somebody last year at a firework display filming the fireworks through their phone 
and watching them, I just noticed them in the corner of my eye, watching the entire firework display through their phone, not even looking once at the sky, just seeing how it was looking on their camera and if it was focusing and how it looked. And that's something we all have to be, I think, very aware of. I think we have to be very aware. We all do it. We all do it. No one's perfect. I still have those moments where I think, oh, crikey, I'm wandering along and I see a, 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 a swan fly by of, you know, 15 swans down the river. It looks stunning. And I, I get my phone out and I'm filming it. And then afterwards, I'm thinking, oh, I should share that with my people on, on my socials. But I didn't even see it in my, with my own eyes. I, I, I saw it through my phone because I was filming it, trying to see if they're in, in focus. I did exactly what that girl did at the firework display. And who have I done it for? I've, I've done it for other people to see and I haven't actually witnessed it with my own eyes. And I still do it. We all do it. We just need to be a bit more aware. And now if I posted a, a swan flyby, it's probably because I've seen quite a few that day and I wouldn't have filmed the others. But there was a point when the fifth one, I'll get my camera out. I think we just have to be a little bit more aware in those situations. What's the next step then? You touched on it a little bit at the beginning. What's the next plan? Um, so I think what's been great about doing this book is, but I mean, my everyday job is a musician and doing this has kind of made me realise, oh, I can do other things. I, I know that sounds crazy, but <laughs> like I don't know. I feel like there's this huge pressure when you come out of music school or you you know you launch yourself into the work world to just do that thing that you've focused on doing. And as you as you get older, your priorities change, your focus changes, you change as a person, and, and your needs change, and your needs need to be met. And you're the only one who knows you well enough to find what those things are to meet them. And this book, I just went, oh gosh, I I I feel great because I was I was doing a music job at RSC at the same time as writing this. And it it just offered me so much nourishment outside of my everyday job. And um and I've been really inspired by that. And by you actually, with you know, the multiple things that you do <laughs> of, of the same thing of just going, wow, we we don't need to be one thing we can be lots of things and and change those things and, and they also benefit it's really exciting. those things also benefit one another i know uh, the singer jesse ware who i'm a huge fan of she said that she got fed up with the music industry the way it was ran the music she was making i think she did coachella and um she was basically playing to an empty tent and she and her mum said to her i think it's time to just think about this a little bit and that's when she created her food podcast with her mother that became a huge success table manners and they've just sold out the london palladium i think three nights doing the podcast live but now um, in lockdown she created what i think is her best album to date her fourth album and she's now her career's just boomed and i went to see her in brixton academy a couple of nights ago sold out for three nights and it, it changed everything because she had something else to work alongside this her food mm. i think she's got a recipe book now as well you know all the other things that go along with it and it's something else and it improved her music and her love for the music industry because she had something else to think about it's not all consuming it's not all pigeonholed into one thing and i actually think as a performer i've enjoyed performing more in these last couple of years that I have something else to do as well, because it, it, it just, it makes it all more enjoyable rather than just all focused on that one thing. And if you're not getting as many gigs as you'd like, or you're, or things aren't quite working out, it can be, it can, it can bring on my anxiety. Whereas now it's like, that's okay. I'll just do a little bit more of this over here. And I think that's probably the same with you. How great that you were at, you say at the RCA, um, RCA? <laughs> RSC. <laughs> having, your car, having your car fixed. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I can fix cars. Just pop the bonnet. But listen, you can do everything. You're a musical director. You're a published photographer. Uh, did you also say you speak Korean now as well? Uh, well, I, I, I wouldn't say it. I, I, if, you want, if you want two beers and a plate of chicken or you need to... So you need to know where the British Embassy is. I'm your gal. You're the person to ask for. That's, I love that. That's amazing. That, so that's fine. I can deal with that. And I and I think as well for for anyone who's thinking about doing something, it doesn't it doesn't need to even need to be 
profitable you know it, it just whatever your in wherever your interests lie of just kind of going just taking a moment to go what do i need what are my needs what what's missing what might fulfill that and just going with it because i never went out to north korea with the intention of writing a book that just that yeah. came about much later of of really towards the end and going wow i have this story that maybe people want to hear about um and i and i feel like i i would like to share that and develop it well listen thank you so much for talking today i've absolutely loved it you are an absolute inspiration um i just think it's fascinating i think like you say if you can write a book when you had no idea you're going to write it it just happened little by little day by day and now here you are with a big old proper book that i've got in my hands here north korea like nowhere else available everywhere basically isn't yeah. it it's available everywhere it I is think- yeah I think it's amazing. And that you're a musical director as well. And you speak fluent Korean. <laughs> <laughs> Managing expectations there as always, Mark. <laughs> if you want to order a sandwich, she speaks fluent Korean. But apart from yep. that, yeah, Absolutely. don't go anywhere near it. Um, <laughs> listen, darling, thank you so much. And we'll put all your details on here as well. But um, yeah, I can't wait for the second one, darling. I really can't. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I have to say, you you have totally motivated me to go out walking, actually, because I I have I watch your videos every day. I actually, ashamedly, I watch them while I'm still lying in bed, half asleep. And I'm <laughs> I like, think most people do. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I've gone from some people saying that they watch me whilst they're cleaning their teeth and getting ready in the morning, while they're getting kids ready in the morning, and someone said they watch me whilst they're on the loo in the morning. So it go it go it goes through all directions quite literally actually (laughs) changing lives here I'm changing lives (laughs) oh I had so much fun chatting to Lindsay she's so inspirational and I just love watching her succeeding with this book which has now been translated into another two languages North Korea like nowhere else by Lindsay Miller is available everywhere and it's just beautiful it's absolutely beautiful and I loved chatting to her today we've done a couple of pantos which were a lot of fun and to see her do something completely different on the sideline it's just a joy inspirational and also um if you head to upgradeyourday.co.uk forward slash shop i have a little workbook on there available at the moment and some of the the sections in there talk about upgrading your day with photography and how i go about it so if you wanted to read a little bit more about what i get up to then you can head there and get the companion which is available now and she's definitely given me a kick up the bum to um step up my photography game because i think the last couple couple of months i've been so busy with other things i haven't really had a chance to get some good snaps get some editing going and like with everyone life gets busy right and sometimes we need to be reminded to go back to something and what we enjoy and what we get joy from so i shall definitely be doing that what an inspiration as always you can rate this episode you can leave a nice review completely up to you I'd really appreciate it though. And if you like and subscribe and follow and all the things you do with podcasts, I'd really appreciate it as well. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a great day. Bye.